Hello, everybody. I'm Alex. And I'm Leona. And this is the Into the Dark Room podcast. And today we have Greg Timmons. How are you today? Hi, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yes, of course. So let's start with where you're from. Sure. Yeah. So I was born in Arizona and I guess I would consider myself from there, but I've lived the majority of my life in York. So York, Pennsylvania, right across the river from PCAD. Awesome. Has that, do you think, shaped your artistic experience? Uh, I think having like an identity from, you know, an origin point definitely pulls some weight. I feel like everybody has a connection to their birthplace that is perceived. Maybe some things are real, right? Like um, I would go back and visit my grandfather who just recently passed away, but spent the entire uh, portion of my living life living in the desert. So I always felt very at home going back there and that that was part of my identity. But, you know, I've lived the majority of my life in York and in Pennsylvania. And so in a way, that's more of who I actually am, even though, you know, I have a connection to my birthplace in a sense, at least in my head. So, yeah, it's definitely shaped who I think I am. Um, I, Sorry, I just wanted that he said, I are. think I am. Right? No, that's like, true. It's kind of evolving. Yeah. I think to the most part, like I, you know, I thought I was someone different when I was 18 than who I think I am now. Um, and I feel like if that happened, if that shift happened once, then it's probably going to happen again. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that that just happens throughout your life. Yeah. You just change and things become different. Yeah. I mean, if you wanted me to speak to something specific, uh, I feel like the people that I've met really make the largest difference. Maybe less of where I'm at and who I'm around specifically that affects my art. So I do surround myself with creative people and the people that I spend the most time with, invent, create, ideate, you know, they're building and making things, whether it's with wood or graphically, other people who use video as a format in their art as well. So I'm constantly connected with people who are generating things. Mm -hmm. And I think that really helps to recontextualize my own ideas. Mm -hmm. you know, I can lean on them. Yeah. I find that to be really fulfilling. So Yeah. So, for the next question, where did your love for videography come from? So, as a child, my mother always had a camera around. She had a VHS camcorder, like one of the really big yeah. ones. It's the size of a briefcase, essentially. <laughs> and you have to shoulder mount it to be able to handle the weight of it. So she's, she was a small, frail person with this huge VHS camcorder <laughs> and filmed everything from my first haircut to playing in the backyard, all these crazy things. So she was documenting my life actively. And there's something that just felt familiar with that to me, but I never considered video as a career potential. So I actually went to school and have a degree in automotive science and then was a diesel mechanic and rebuilt wrecked cars. So reconstruct vehicles. We take collectively as a group of five of us, we would take a wrecked car in the rear and the same model wrecked in the front, cut them in half, weld the good house together, use the best seats out of the two. You know, if one had navigation and the other one didn't, we would put that over, put the best engine in it and we'd make a reconstruct vehicle and get that retitled by the state of Pennsylvania. And I found that like, I really love knowing how things work, but I wasn't being fulfilled in that industry any longer. Like I, I felt like I had achieved my goal of knowing how vehicles work on the inside and that I was going to soon maximize my learning potential there. I don't, looking back, I don't think that's true, right? Like I had a lifelong of learning left to do in that industry, but my perceived value of time versus what I would get out of it seemed like it was diminishing. So before I was really stuck in that career, I pivoted. I backed up and I said, I've always loved photography. 
my mother always had a camera for me, whether it was 35 millimeter or the VHS camcorder. I always had access to camera equipment. And I said, I'm going to lean on that. I want to do portraitures. I'm really interested in meeting people and maybe hearing their stories, what they know. And to continue being a student for life, it's just felt like the next best step. So I went halves in on a camera with a friend. I didn't have enough money to buy the camera that I wanted at the time, but collectively he and I together had enough money to get a decent camera. He was in film school and he wanted to do film for a living. And so I thought this is perfect. I can use it for photography. He can use it for film. We can work out our schedules so that we both have a fair amount of time with the equipment. We both are like-minded in that um, we want to help each other succeed. So we got this camera and I realized quickly through giving him a hand on some of his film projects that I like the challenges that video had, the storytelling component of it, the marriage, the, the marry of narration and, um, I guess I should say marriage of narration and the emotion of audio tracks coming together felt much more complex than a photo in that. I had a challenge I had to overcome that was a lot more involved. And that led me to realize that I would learn more from something more complex. And I'm not talking down on photography. I'm just saying personally, I felt like it was clear to me that the challenges in video were going to be fulfilling. That makes sense. Um, so during your talk, you mentioned having a business partner in partner in starting a company. How was it working with someone when it came to making creative decisions? Yeah, I think there were a lot of conversations in the early stages of building the company together when we realized that we both wanted to do film. And I had that aha moment that revolved around how we would respect one another's ideas and space. And we often said, when we enter into the realm of working together, we leave our egos out the door. And I thought it was a really interesting thing to be developing with someone else. You know, hey, I might have a better idea than your idea, or you might have a better idea than mine, depending on the use case or the client or the project. And so vocalizing that, having a verbal agreement, a verbal contract between one another to not let our egos get in the way of the project was first and foremost. So I feel like that theme continued the entire length of uh, working together. I'm very thankful to have had that. So creatively, we respected one another, but we also were trying to view things that in, in a very, um, I'd say in a way that that was objective rather than subjective. And I know that's difficult to do, but that was always our goal. Would you say that working with, um, working with a partner or working with different creatives and different opinions is important um, in an art career? I feel like in some instances, when you really know what you want for an end product, then uh, sometimes it's best to just, stay isolated in order to complete that body of work. But I feel like the most beautiful things in life come from collaboration and from being open-minded to testing what you thought you knew to be true or exact. And outside influence can definitely bring a lot of value. So in some term, in some ways, like when you already figure out a formula and you know what you're going for, Sometimes insulation from the outside world is necessary. And other times collaboration allows you to solve a problem that you has cropped up along the way that you might not have perceived. An outside perspective can be the thing that carries you through to completion in a more successful way than had you just tried to shoehorn in your original idea uh, to the end. So the company that you guys came up with, what is the name of it? Uh, Demo Productions. And how did you come up with that name? That was actually a combination of our last names. So <laughs> his last name is Diener and my last name is Timmons. And we couldn't come up with an idea that really satisfied what 
we wanted as the face of a company. So we thought something more abstract that doesn't necessarily have a meaning would be best because we could bring meaning to it through the projects and collective voice that we had together. So we combined our last names into a, a weird, um, you know, conglomerate. But the funny thing is the other combinations are horrible. It's like <laughs> demons and uh, team Timner and all, you know, things that didn't really make much sense. Demo felt abstract enough. Yeah. That, you know, it didn't really carry any pre preconceived notion. And I love that people have a problem pronouncing it or they're <laughs> unsure. I think it's actually more memorable that way. That I, was I not agree. intentional. Yeah. But um, a few years in, we were like, people say it, Dymo, <laughs> Demo, Demo. And so that whole process of not knowing whether or not you're saying it right makes you say it over and over in your head more or contemplate it, which then makes the company more memorable. So in a weird way, the odd name actually has been beneficial. It's good marketing. It is. <laughs> haphazard, yeah, haphazard <laughs> marketing strategies that crop out of, you know, thin air. Yeah. <laughs> so through Demo, um, was that the company that you ended up working with for New York Fashion Week? Or... Um, did you end up, because I remember briefly um, your talk and um, you talking about how you had something uh, more to offer because of the equipment that you had. Um, so was that through Demo or was that through just yourself? Yeah, that. so New York Fashion Week was definitely a connection that, that my business partner and I made together and we did that whole line of work through Demo. Um, all the equipment was acquired through the company as well. So as we got more and more jobs, we would reinvest a large majority of our income back into equipment. And what we were thinking was, at the time, our parents were really supportive of us starting this company. And so we could lean on reduced and free rent. Um, you know, moms always make the best meals. They're also free. You know, we were in a really good place in life to be able to take earnings and reinvest them back into the goal of the company. And our parents collectively, all four of them were very supportive of what we were doing. So we eventually acquired a camera jib. It's like essentially a long arm that you can put the camera on the end of and there's counterweights and you can sort of fly the camera up real high or skim it along the ground. Like you have a really wide range of movements that you can do. And because the arm is long, so it was, I think, from the ground to the highest point, 16 feet, your fulcrum is large. So it can pivot not only up and down 16 feet, but it has a wide arc uh, in a circular motion around its base that it can move. And we found that it's more of a niche market in New York City and in, in other high traffic areas. It's more of a niche market to be a camera crane or jib operator simply because people don't have the space in the city to own that kind of equipment. And a lot of times they can't move it through public transport. And so it was definitely a specialized piece of equipment that got us known for doing that. And it was really fun. We would, you know, fly over the crowd during fashion shows and uh, use that to have a perspective on the runway that no one else was able to, to get. That's really interesting. I know my uh, my class has a lot of people that are very interested in um, fashion photography, let alone like being at New York Fashion Week. So what was that experience like? I know you said you didn't really, it wasn't your thing, um, but how could, say, like one of my classmates get involved um, with New York Fashion Week? Right. So like any really good connection that's made for something valuable in life, it's usually through someone who knows and likes and trusts you. So although we had this equipment and that was probably a really big draw for some people to hire us. 
I think we were getting hired time and time again at every job, not just Fashion Week, but everything that we did was hired because people liked working with us. There's, you know, untold numbers of videographers or filmmakers that you can work with as a business or as a designer um, or anyone who's making a product who's looking to show that off and, and hire someone to do that work for them creatively. Why are they choosing you? You know, that's, that's a huge component. They had to, these designers weren't dealing directly with us, but they hired a trusted crew that of producers that then would hire the individual camera people. And, you know, people are only hiring who they know and who they like. So someone might be super talented, but really difficult to work with. And that might open a door in one way and close the door in another way. So I think in order for, I guess to back up, Fashion Week is really fun and exciting. So you were asking how it feels. Okay. It's definitely a thrill. There's a lot of buzz. There's a lot of excitement. There's nothing like being in the room that VIPs are going to come into and being there before the lights and the action all happens, right? The sets are built out. There's been people working there for sometimes a week or more to build out the space. There's only so many venues in New York City. So they, you know, these unions come in and these guys and women build these sets that are elaborate and gorgeous. And none of that really sees the light of day. And so to look behind the curtain, you know, and, and see that stuff happening was special. It's also a really nerve wracking environment. So by the time the show comes around, if you mess up during that 10 minutes of the show, it's not happening again. You only get one chance. And a lot of people who make mistakes are, you know, they're cut early or they don't get asked to come back. Um, in the video world, luckily, because there's 10, usually 10 camera people at various points, a couple on the media riser, uh, a jib, a camera jib, some off angles, maybe a, a camera from the rafters. There's a lot of opportunity to cover up mistakes, but you don't want to be known for being sloppy, right? So I think the stakes were high and some of that was nerve wracking. You're there eight, 10 hour a day just for a 10 minute show. Um, I think the pressure could kind of get to you as far as, and your third aspect to that question, how can someone get involved in this? Really? I think the best way to find yourself where you want to be is to surround yourself with as many people who are as close to that as possible. And, um, I did a lot of odd jobs. Like I, I wasn't, I didn't come become a cameraman overnight. I didn't just get camera jib jobs overnight. I did line producing and I did crafty for Buzzfeed. So I was literally the food guy on set, putting granola bars out on a table for, for people. And all the while I was making sure that my demeanor was positive and that I took every job that I was hired to do seriously and people noticed that and they wanted to be around me. And that opened up the conversation of, do you have anything beyond just putting food out on the table? Do you have, um, you know, do you have a better, a higher up job with more responsibility for me? And if so, what would that entail? What do I need to do? What sorts of things should I not fail on? And just, through having that attitude, I think people gravitate towards that. It's magnetic, right? If someone's positive and upbeat, you want to be around them versus being downtrodden and melancholy. Yeah. So is that how you formed your connections? Um, that's a lot of how things continued to move, right? Like it was like, it was like the, yeah, that sort of attitude and taking on jobs and being cheerful that definitely opened up more doors because more people wanted to work with us. And we both had that opinion, you know, Hey, let's do the best work that we can. We don't know everything and we're not good at everything, but we can do our best always cheerfully. And that got noticed. So I think now, you know, I'm looking to pivot and it's part of the reason why I'm, I'm here. I think the high stress environment can take a toll 
sometimes. And I think it's all right to take a step back and process things and change your approach to life. So reinvention is, you know, change is the only constant is some famous quote, right? So I think being able to roll with the punches and adapt to what you know you need and want for each phase of life is a pretty important thing to get used to and, and to work at becoming better at. So, huh. yeah. For our listeners, we actually forgot to mention that he's the newest professor here at PCAD. Yes, and we are happy to have you here, of we course, yeah. sharing your lovely knowledge. I'm happy to us. be here. Yeah. Yes. Hmm, there's more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so since you've worked in a lot of different video field fields, fields, I can't speak. Okay. Um, what do you think is your niche now? Since you know you went from New York fashion to like just like going through and taking a dro drone, not droid, <laughs> drone through factories and making commercials for them. Like, what is your niche now? I feel like I've always been able to navigate the equipment well. The, the crane and its needs and how that needs to be set up and operated or the camera and its rigging in order to achieve some new goal, whether it's going on a stabilization device or it needs to, um, for one example, one job, we hooked up and rigged the camera. It was in a, a mine. So in we made it seem as if the camera fell through the earth and just like landed in this puddle in the mine. So we had to go up on a, a man lift and rig up some climbing equipment to the ceiling there, to the lag bolts in the ceiling of the mine and actually drop the camera in free fall towards the ground and then catch it before it hit the ground. And, you know, we lost our expensive <laughs> camera. So there were some high stake things that we had to rig up and, uh, I would say that that's my specialty. If there's an idea, how can we actually make that come to life? If I need to get a, a jib shot over the crowd at Fashion Week, but I can't actually, due to insurance or liability, fly over people, how do I still make that movement interesting? Those are the sorts of problems that I think I've become really comfortable with solving. And... So I think my problem persists in generating fresh new ideas. Sometimes I lean back on the things that I've already solved the problem for in the past because I, I know a potential outcome or a potential answer to it. So my specialty probably lies in that. Definitely drone work, um, anything technical with, with gear. I love problem solving that. I mean, I do do editing, so I... <laughs> You know, in order to make my creations come to life, I have to edit them. But I wouldn't necessarily consider myself an editor. I'm good enough to make my ideas happen, but not not good enough to say that that's my forte. Yeah, that makes sense. It's just another process that I have to wear, you know, in the line of many hats that I, I have to wear <laughs> to be a, a freelancer and yeah. problem solve and bring things to fruition as a one-man band. It's a lot of hats. It is a lot of hats. <laughs> you have to become an accountant, you know, a business person, an idea generator, a producer, an editor, a camera person. If you want to do things start to finish in the video world, it is a lot. Yeah. It definitely is a lot. So there are certain categories that I feel I'm good at and then categories that I always feel like I should improve on, that always feel like they're lacking. Yeah. And most people don't notice the shortcomings when they watch you know something they'll point out the strength that they see mm -hmm. but um i think that's important to know that as you're developing your skills professionally there's always going to be something lagging behind that feels like you know it's it's the elephant in the room you, you don't want to talk about because it's like oh, I can't, that, you know i know that's bad i know the i'm not great with audio so um i definitely need to expand and grow in in that department of equalizing tracks and learning more about how sound works in general could greatly help me because it's 50% of people, what people are experiencing sensory wise when they view a video, they're seeing an image and they're hearing sounds. And I oftentimes put the emphasis on the image and 
Um, so I think it's okay to know about yourself too. And, and it's not all comfortable, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. So both me and Leona, um, before the podcast, were talking about, um, cause I'm a senior. So I've had, uh, I'm in my last video class this semester. So I've had three video classes here, but we really haven't been taught about many video artists. So we were curious to know if you have any video artists or videographers in mind um, when you teach or just in general that you like to watch or reference. I think for inspiration, it's, you know, it's wide. I, I mean, I can't say that I look up to a particular cinematographer or videographer. Rather, I, you know, there's certain things that have touched me in a way and, and speak to me that I might like. It might be a series. So I love Chef's Table on Netflix. And I know that depending on what season you're looking at, there was a different director of photography and a different director. And so they're not all the same. You can see the style change when it shifts from one crew to the next, right? So the pizza one is different than the original one is different, I think, from the, the French cuisine one. But I just, generally speaking, I love portraitures of people and I'm really inspired when I see that. So I, I use video as a tool to continue being a student for life because with video production, you're always getting VIP access. People are always showing the best sides of the tricks and the trades and the tips that they have within their industry. And so you're always learning, right? You're always a VIP guest. You always have candid access to your subjects and they're usually professionals in their realm. So you're learning things that they've spent a lifetime accumulating knowledge over. And that's really powerful, right? And everyone has a reason to film everything. So it's necessary to film all components of everything, whether it's for a safety video or for an advertisement, whatever it may be, you know, fashion, sharing an idea. Um, some people are looking to, to change the world in a better way through sharing content. And there's always something to learn. So my inspiration just comes from constantly finding myself in a situation or a scenario where I'm, I'm in that realm, in that space. And as far as inspiration goes, I mean, really doc documentary style portraitures are beautiful. Um, another inspiration is the set of films from the eighties, the Koyana Scotsi documentaries. And um, there's a film called Baraka and another one. It's the sequel to it called Samsara. And there's sort of like a poetic time film where they're not, there's no narration and there's no main characters. There's just like, it's almost atmosphere and uh, belief. The only thing that they're curating is what image you're seeing and how it's cut in relation to the other images. So the sequence that they put it in, but it's kind of left up to the viewer as to what inspiration or what thoughts you have from that. And I find that to be really freeing and relaxing and I can watch it year and year again and always think of something new when I watch those films. So I think that's really powerful. That's definitely an inspiration for me. Hmm. Yeah. Do you feel like you prefer like a more, um, when you're, when you're filming? Um, because I think you've mentioned and I've seen like some of your work as well, um, as far as commercial work goes that you showed, um, during the talk that we had. Um, but do you prefer like a more, um, natural scene to shoot in or do you like the studio better? Oh, that's a good question. Interesting. Yeah. I think, I think the recipe that my previous business partner and I came up with is like a hybrid. So what we'll do is we'll go on location and, um, I still do this, but you know, I'll arrive and I want to film someone within the context of where they're at. So I want to enter their business and film them in their business, for example, because I, I don't, I'm not necessarily looking to go for like a clean apple white background. I want to see the person where they are there. I think that there's interest and context that you can derive from that. But at the same time, 
oftentimes those spaces are less than ideal to film in. So they have fluorescent lights. There's a lot of like magenta to green shift tint in the lights where the frame rate I'm using and the lights refresh rate cause banding or flickering or yeah. it's just, you know, there's no light maybe in their den of a, in an office. So I'll bring the studio to their location. And what I mean by that is I'll bring a rather portable three point lighting setup and then set it up so that there's somewhat of a studio lighting feel or look to this interview that I'm conducting, mm -hmm. but it's within their actual space. So it's sort of like a hybrid studio documentary kind of feel in the way that the image turns out. And I really like that. I'm drawn to it and it might become an overplayed outdone thing, but some things I feel like will stand the test of time. Always seeing someone within their space is pretty powerful. It's something that I go to time and time again. I feel like creatively, you know, for a student, whether in school or about to graduate like you, you know, you're finding your voice and what is your brand. And so the way that I'm doing something might be the exact opposite of what you want to do. But I think it's really powerful to know like the vanilla ice cream version of something yeah. is what I like to say. And you can turn it into Rocky Road if you want, or it could be <laughs> peanut butter swirl. Like, it, you know, <laughs> you can take it and make it whatever you want. So of finding course. your voice is real powerful. And I think just trust your gut. If you're really drawn to a certain style, then uh, you should explore that because there's a reason you're feeling drawn to it, even if you can't articulate it. And it's like something that. that you'll get known for. Yeah. yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. Helps you develop your style. Yeah. I get that. I mean, someone's going to hire you for your attitude, for your style. <laughs> the, you know, if you're trying to be someone else or you're trying to do something or mimic something that just doesn't wholly feel like you, it's going to be clear in, in weird ways. Like we're all professional viewers of media and we're all prof like we're prof we've by 18 years old, you've seen untold number of commercials and hours of footage, you know what good production looks like, but you might not have the verbiage and language or vocabulary to be able to express why you feel something is good, bad, or you're indifferent to it or whatever. To speak to it is, I think, the the thing that we're not literate in as Americans, but we consume, we're professional consumers. So you know when you see something of high quality. And I think someone's going to know like, hey, this person has really taken their vibe and turned it into something marketable. And I can only get that from them. Right. So I trust like it, go with it, go with your gut. Like you said, develop it. See what, yeah. See what happens. There's no, nothing bad is going to occur from a deep dive and exploration into the things that you are interested in. So, so following that, Mm -hmm. What is some advice? Like, do you have any advice for any aspiring videographers? Just in general. Um, it could be like in regards to technicality or um, like we were talking about earlier with connections. Um, just general advice. Sure. I think the world, as we know, it only revolves around people and the other people that you know and are looking to know and so relationship building i think is at the core of it where there's lots of technical stuff that i could give advice on and that's probably my specialty if i were to have one but i think in tandem to the gear relationship building is the other thing that i put a majority of a large majority of my time into so learning the equipment but also building relationships those go hand in hand and I found that they're both equally as important to yielding a fruitful uh, self-employment or for creating meaningful projects. A body of work, you know, only exists if I have other people around me. So working on people skills can't hurt regardless of if you're a video or a fine arts major or, you know, whatever. You're going to have to deal with other people in a creative setting and collaborate with others or work to tell someone else's story. So I think no matter what happens, people are at the core of that. And if you can, um, if you can work on people skills, it's going to come back tenfold. 
So, and that's really cool advice to be able to give because I'm absolutely confident that if you work on becoming the best people person that you can be, it's going to help you be a business person or a better engage with people deeper creatively or make the connections that bring you somewhere big like New York Fashion Week. It's, it's a skill that maybe doesn't get enough playtime and is probably more important than most other things. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that could be argued. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it all leads back to. It's people. always people. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, welcome would you to like PCAD. To, yes. Welcome to PCAD. <laughs> Yay. Um, would you like to tell the viewers where they can find you? Uh, sure. Yeah, I actually have to look up my Instagram <laughs> handle. That is completely fair. Now, my, my personal one was like a joke. I, um, I didn't want to make an Instagram. And then I was on the board of an arts organization. And there was a show that we were judging. And everything had to be submitted through Instagram and wow. uh, with ta a tag, you know, yeah. like a hashtag. And so I had to make an account. So I just offhandedly <laughs> made it under a weird handle and then uh, it stuck. I never got rid of it. But my business one is uh, Demo Productions. So D I E M O Productions. That's on Instagram. Uh, DemoProductions.com is my website. My email, e everything's there. Like if you have the Demo Productions website or Instagram, you can either direct message me or find me through the web so um, I don't have everything listed there it's like impossible to have the rights or even keep up simply with showing off your work when yeah. you're busy making work so you know I've taken a, a selection of stuff and put it on the website but if you're interested in seeing anything particular that I might have talked about today I'm more than happy to try to dig that up and pull some stuff out. I don't really have any fashion week on there. It's usually work for hire, which is, you know, all the intellectual property gets given to the person who's paying you to do yeah. the work. So a lot of that stuff is, is out there. It's just not mine to show off. Yeah. That makes sense. It's uh, something you might encounter moving forward. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much again. And yeah. Awesome. Cool. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, of course. Okay, we are good.